When you think of insects first taking to the air, you might imagine flowers luring them there. After all, the story of plants evolving to attract pollinators is a familiar one. But there's one problem. Insects developed powered flight more than 100 million years before flowering plants even evolved. So if it wasn't about finding food, why did they do it? Well, it might have been a different relationship, millions of years older, that pushed them into the air, escaping from a particular kind of predator. It looks like insects first flew to avoid becoming food. See, spiders and their ancestors have been driving an arms race that began before either they or insects stepped foot onto land and resulted in their first powered flight on Earth. But how did this competition of webs versus wings drive such a massive evolutionary adaptation into an entirely new realm? For the same reason, it turns out, that spiders today are abandoning their aerial webs and returning to the ground as a new type of wings take over. Eons is possible thanks to rad viewers like you, who back us on Patreon. Your support of our videos through Patreon is vital in keeping our educational mission going. Whether it's the research and production of our videos, commissioning accurate paleo art, and of course, paying our wonderful hosts, this all happens thanks to your support. Patrons get access to special videos from our hosts, digital puzzles with our paleo art, and at the eontologist level, shout outs in our episodes. To show our thanks, we're declaring Patron Appreciation Month. Become a patron at the Paleozoic level by March 31st, and you will get the very first Eons trading card created by our team of paleo artists and writers. This art is also featured on our new Permian t-shirt, which absolutely rules. Many Eons viewers remember that for a good long time, our videos used to end with a shout out to one of our patrons, Steve. Now you can be Steve, a super terrific, extremely vital eontologist. For every month, we have 50 members in this new Patreon tier will shout out Steve in our videos. And to celebrate with the entire Eons community this Patron Appreciation Month, there will be a live stream on March 27th, 2025. Thank you for all your support. Spiders belong to the group Chelicerata, which got its start in the Cambrian Seas over 500 million years ago. The early chelicerates were predators, preying on crustaceans, the ancestors of insects. Eventually, the pressure from these predators likely drove some crustaceans into the inner tidal zone, seeking refuge and stashing their eggs to protect them. But these ancient spider ancestors had some traits that made it easy to follow their prey as they made their way toward land. Their segmented bodies and exoskeletons helped them move around without the aid of water, and they had flappy appendages called book gills that allowed them to breathe through gas exchange. For example, marine chelicerate relatives that are alive today, like horseshoe crabs, can spend long stretches of time on land as long as their book gills remain moist. Spider ancestors could probably do this too. These spider ancestors also likely excreted a precursor to silk, which may have acted as a protective bubble, like a spacesuit that kept their book gills wet, easing their transition to land. At first, their crustacean prey probably stuck to intertidal and damp environments because they also needed the water to breathe. But eventually, both the ancestors of insects and the chelicerate predators chasing them began co-radiating into a wide range of forms. We know that they were radiating at the same time because scientists see a statistical relationship in the relative abundance of each group. Using statistical methods to track the groups helps us understand the complex relationships between predator and prey in the deep past. And when spider ancestors diversify in ways that tightly correlate with crustacean diversification, this points to a real-world relationship, telling scientists that these two groups were likely radiating in response to each other. Methods like these can help paint a picture of what was happening when well-preserved fossils of these little creatures are rare. Luckily, we do have some fossil remains, too. The first fossils that most likely represent insects are from Scotland, dating to the early Devonian period, between 400 and 412 million years ago. And the first truly spider-like relative followed, with the oldest known fossil, Atarcopus, coming from New York and dating to about 385 million years ago. This land dweller was making silk, and we know this because the fossil shows that Atarcopus had silk-excreting organs known as spigots. But they weren't making webs just yet. They seem to have lacked the appendages that spigots need to sit on, known as spinnerets, to help pull that silk into a thread. Instead, Atarcopus was likely using silk to line its burrow, supporting its structure, or maybe to help navigate with safety lines or to protect its eggs. And the presence of Atarcopus on land and its ability to make silk meant a new stage was unfolding for the race between predator and prey. Having now driven insect ancestors to land, the predators began exploring new ways to pursue their prey, looking toward the air. 
Now, there's a gap in the fossil record for both spiders and insects that makes it hard to trace the exact timing of when powered flight took off and web development began. But the next true insect appears in the early Carboniferous period, around 320 million years ago, in the form of the dragonfly-like Delishala. And within the next 10 million years, flying insects became common, with spiders' abundance keeping pace. It's around this time that the fossil record reveals the first true spider, Arthrolycosa. And while we haven't found any fossilized webs from this time, Arthrolycosa had the anatomy necessary for weaving. The spigots and spinnerets were both present and arranged to make the silk thread and weave it. So scientists think that simple funnel webs were likely being built, probably to capture jumping insects, as well as weak and fallen flyers. And with the continued expansion of the forests after the Devonian, many of these plant structures provided the scaffolding that spiders needed to start attaching their webs to things in more vertical positions. This allowed spiders to begin making increasingly complex webs to trap their increasingly complex prey. Because flight was so radically successful, flying insects had become abundant by the Permian period, 298 million years ago with the fossil assemblages including both insects and spiders beginning to appear. And this, some scientists argue, is where the arms race began to really pick up. Insects in the Permian had to develop more sophisticated ways of avoiding the increasingly complex webs. By the Triassic period 252 million years ago, both the mechanics of insect flight and the weaving abilities of spiders continued to radiate into new and different forms. Around this time, the spiders that weave vertical orb webs, those classic spiral wheel-shaped webs, began to emerge. These spiders are known as araniomorphs. Unlike funnel webs that capture whatever falls into them, orb webs are built to catch insects in flight. And this period also records the earliest mygalomorphs, the group that would later give rise to tarantulas and trapdoor spiders. By the Middle Jurassic, roughly 165 million years ago, the earliest member of another spider family appears, and it also happens to be the largest fossil spider known. But it's not until the early Cretaceous period, 140 million years ago, that we see the first fossil web preserved in amber. One amber specimen dating to about 110 million years ago even contains a fly and a mite trapped in silk. So amber fossils provide hard evidence of spiders building webs and using them to capture flying insects, rather than inferring this from fossil spider anatomy. It's only at this point that the co-radiation of flowering plants and flying insects finally takes off, driving diversity well after spiders drove insects into the air. This marks the height of web-building spiders dominating the air, their peak web era, if you will. But something else was happening to the spiders at the end of the Cretaceous period, too. Their winged adversaries in the webs versus wings arms race had taken on a different form. See, during the time of the dinosaurs, the battlefield had become more crowded, with birds and their ancestors as well as mammals hunting both insects and spiders. These spider predators, like birds, probably cued in on the web as a kind of flag pointing out a meal. So with more arms in the race, spiders began evolving in a new direction, adapting away from the web. See, webs are costly to make and maintain, given the energy needed to create and build and repair them. So by the late Cretaceous, some spiders began returning to the ground, seeking insect prey with fewer risks and lower energy costs. And non-web-based spiders had begun radiating by the mass extinction that ended the Cretaceous period 66 million years ago. So these are non-web-based spiders. They're analog. They're like your old-fashioned brick-and-mortar spiders that you had to like meet in person, because they're not online. This group started speciating faster than the orb weavers, indicating that this was the direction that the group was and still is evolving, a trend that continues to this day. Now, non-web-based spiders are still using silk, but instead of webs, they use it to set up other kinds of traps, like nets or dropping lines to fish for prey. And many, like wolf spiders and tarantulas, are going back to the ancestral use of egg brooding and burrow lining. Today, spiders are in all environments, from land to water to air, making them important predators in almost every environment that provides a meal. And while they largely seem to be abandoning their web-based aerial combat, leaving it to the birds, the arms race is still going on, just using different battlegrounds and tactics. So the story of spiders and insects reminds us that coevolution can be about reaching towards something and running away. The world of the Jurassic was a lot like ours. Similar interactions between plants and insects were happening, but the players have changed over time. Because it looks like pollination by insects actually got going twice. Find out more in our episode, How Pollination Got Going Twice. And thanks to this month's eontologist for hanging out with us. <laughs> Addie, Annie and Eric Higgins, Carl Wolfel, Jackie Scott Ralston, Jake Hart, John Davison Ng, Juan M., Melanie Lamb Carnivale, Nico Robin, Raphael Hassa. And as always, thank you for joining me in the Ken Barnes studio. 
Subscribe at youtube.com slash eons for more creature features. Who names these things? Who's like, who sees a part of it like an animal's anatomy? He's like, I call that a spigot. That seems super appropriate. Like a little handle. Turn, turn it on, turn it off. Yeah, it's kind of cute. <laughs> Gotta make some silk. <laughs> My dad used to call faucets spigots. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's okay. Is that a generational thing? Pittsburgh thing? I don't know.